Uh, hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today and excuse the delay. We're doing our best. <laughs> My name is Tasneem Bagdadi. I'm head of education and programs at the Migro Museum for Gegenwartskunst. And uh, I'm delighted uh, today to have you all here with us for this artist talk with Pilvi Takkala, along with our moderators, uh, Michael Birchall, who is curator at the Museum for, um, Migro Museum for Gegenwartskunst, and Chloe Stead, who is assistant editor at Fries Magazine. Before I hand over to the speakers, I would like to first express my gratitude to Freeze Magazine, particularly to publisher Lisa Gerstorf, who's also present with us today, for their collaboration. Uh, I'm happy to see that this partnership between Freeze Magazine and Migro Museum for Gegenwartskunst uh, is happening once again this year in the context of Zurich, uh, Zurich Art Weekend. And I would also like to extend my thanks, uh, therefore, to Luma Westbau for hosting us uh, today at the Schwarzes Café, and also the team uh, at Zurich Art Weekend for their support. Lastly, I would like to provide you with a note. You already wear your red dots. I can see them. That's great. Uh, please keep them visibly uh, on you, because uh, if you wish to join us uh, for a drink afterwards, starting at 7 approximately, if we go through, uh, through the talk quickly enough, then uh, you will have the chance to get a free drinks on the White Terrace at our uh, Aporo afterwards. And we warm warmly invite you to do so and join us. And now I invite you all to um, immerse yourselves into the conversation on Pilvi Takala's artistic practice, um, guided by the moderators, Michael Birchall and Chloe Stead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tasneem. Thank you so much, Tasneem. Um, I think my, my microphone's not on uh, at the moment. Coming on now? No. This is what happens when you don't sound check, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, were, we um, had a slight delay this afternoon. Um, so, um, yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce the exhibition very briefly. Um, it, it's been an absolute joy to work on this exhibition with Pilvi Takala. Um, Pilvi worked as a security guard in Finland for a period of six months um, where she worked in um, a mall. And... During this period of time, she collected her observations. She had conversations with her colleagues. And this is what you can see in the exhibition at the Migro Museum for Gegenwart's Kunst. So I encourage you all, if you haven't seen the work, to go and take a look at that, um, at, at least after the talk. Um, I think for me, what's particularly interesting about the work is how it questions the role of security in society and how it also questions our own position about who's being watched or who does the watching. And um, when you take a look at this exhibition, you will see what I mean. So now um, I'm going to hand over to Chloe, who's going to um, begin with the questions. And then Chloe will hand over to me at the end for some questions. And then we'll hear from the audience as well. Thank you. So um, I'm going to ask you a little bit about some of your older work before we get on to Close Watch. Um, so my first question is, conventional wisdom suggests that many people that become artists do so because they want to avoid a nine-to-five job. And so I find it kind of fascinating that so much of your art practice is actually you kind of putting on a uniform or a suit and going and doing a nine-to-five job. <laughs> or, you know, maybe with Close Watch it was an evening thing, but, you know, doing kind of eight hours. Um, and I just wondered a little bit, like, how your interest in corporate, the corporate world kind of began and how it first found its way into your artwork. It was actually through like invitation. So um, the work, uh, the trainee from 2008, where I worked at Deloitte or was a trainee at Deloitte, and then from that position kind of uh, decided to stop physical work and just sit and think. Um, that was something that uh, kind of came through Kiasma, the museum in Helsinki, who had a like sponsorship relationship with Deloitte. And the curators at the museum thought when Deloitte like, wanted to work with an artist somehow, they talked to me and then together we proposed that I would get a, get a job. Mm. So I guess <laughs> I did propose that. But um, I just thought, oh, like, if I have access to this kind of environment that I'm not familiar with, it's really worth, uh, worth a shot to like, try to figure out, first of all, how to fit in, like, what, what does it take? And then also, like, what does it take to kind of question the norms and mm -hmm. so on? So 
that work actually was quite important because it was a period of a month, so a kind of like long durational performance or something. And and I found really uh, how you know social pressure is really physical. Like this was not something I had realized so strongly before. So there were many things about that experience that I really valued for my practice. And then kind of after that experience, kind of tried to again get into these places where the stakes are much higher. So before that, I had done a lot of work in like places such as malls or semi-public spaces mm -hmm. where people, of course, still want to police your behavior, but in a workplace, it's just much more intense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are, they really do care about like how you behave. So is that intensity of the kind of world of work um, that kind of drew you yeah. into it? Okay. Um, as I watched, you know, a lot of your videos again in preparation for the talk, what struck me was how many of them kind of touch on current zeitgeists. So in recent months, um, maybe you guys have read, um, there seems to be a lot of articles about quiet quitting, for example, which is a little bit what you did. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, and it yeah, basically it means doing the bare minimum at work instead of trying to kind of distinguish yourself. Um, and it's a, you know, as, a, as, a, as you mentioned, it's a term that could be described, could describe your character in the, tra in the trainee. Um, and so many of your kind of videos are often described as kind of awkward or even kind of excruciating, I think I read in, in one review. Um, but I was also kind of wondering if they could also be seen as aspirational or, um, you know, yeah, something to live up to in a landscape where many people, I think particularly members of Generation Z, are trying to find kind of better work-life balance. I mean, I in my like work and practice, I'm not like trying to like give a good example, like everybody <laughs> do what I do, but obviously I think it's important to question the norm. So, you know, at Deloitte, after I left, people did have a discussion about like what is acceptable working method and so on. And I'm sure there was some aspect of like rethinking, you know, some kind of aspirational moment for some, I don't know, or then everybody was just like, you know, this is this just doesn't work. Let's forget about it. <laughs> you know, like everybody look busy again. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, just the fact of like qu asking the question, opening up something that really like we have, we really care about that people like play by the rules, mm. and then just to think again, like why do we have this rule? I think that's always, you know, it's always helpful. But yeah, I I don't know how many people who actually have a job then want to risk, you know, like mm. the really like exclusion that you get from really behaving against the norm. But you can do little steps. You can try to like make space for something different. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think another thread throughout your practice, um, as you mentioned, was this kind of interest in subverting social norms. Um, whether it's kind of going through a shopping center with a wad of cash. I think we should have had some images, but unfortunately they don't seem to be uh, working. Um, and, uh, yeah, sorry, so uh, you were going through a shopping center, or, uh, or the street, was it, actually? Um, that was a shopping center. Yeah, the shopping center, sorry, yeah. with a wad of cash in a transparent bag, or kind of showing up overdressed and alone to a formal dance. Um, these activities kind of often mean putting yourself in quite uncomfortable and kind of embarrassing situations. And I think something I often joke about, you know, being British is that I'm always embarrassed. Mm. Um, but you kind of seem, at least from the outside, to be kind of immune to this pressure. And I, I kind of wondered if you were someone that also, you know, always felt comfortable challenging the conventions or whether it's something that you just kind of had to get used to, you had to work on. It's definitely the latter. Like, <laughs> you know, I totally understand what's pe what people expect, and it is hard to to do some do something against it or do differently. Mm. So it's a muscle I kind of grew in my practice, and that's really in the core of the of the practice to be able to like take that pressure and stick to the plan mm. or you know stick to the thing. Like, and also for me, when things get awkward, it gets good. Like. Mm -hmm. The worse I feel in a way, like socially, <laughs> the better it's going. <laughs> so there's a, I, I kind of like tell my brain, you know, fantastic, <laughs> good job. But then, I mean, I do have to deal with the kind of uh, emotional load afterwards. So there's yeah. a preparation to kind of like get into it and really imagine like, you know, imagine reactions. I never know like what the reactions are exactly going to be, but I do like I, I predict that it's going to be awkward. People will not like it there will be like rejection, these mm -hmm. things, and then 
I just tried to find a way to like stick to it, and then afterwards somehow like uh, let it go mm -hmm. or deal with deal with that, those emotions. So this kind of script, in a way, or uh, an idea of what you're going to mm. do, is is how you've kind of learned to deal with it or to kind of push past the embarrassment, I guess. Yeah, I guess there has been like from the beginning, beginning like some super simple idea, and I really wanted to see how people react to that. So my like wish to gain that knowledge was like larger than the mm. than the like pain from the <laughs> from the like embarrassment or awkwardness. And then in my practice, I think I've as I grew this like muscle, I I, I could do like more complex things mm. also where there's like like in the training, I just had you know as long as I don't do anything physical, any physical work, it's fine. Like mm -hmm. you know, even though like my I had to stop my body from like. Let's take the phone. Let's text someone. Let's do something. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's a practice that like you get better at it slowly yeah. and slowly. <laughs> like the idea of it being kind of a muscle that you kind of grow. But it's also interesting because I think writers also tell tell ourselves if something bad happens, like, well, at least I'll get a good story out of it. <laughs> yeah, it's good one, so yeah. yeah, I think it's uh, something that we all do. Um, I kind of wanted to ask about you know the social norms and how people kind of react to those who break them, whether you find that that changes from country to country, because obviously you've you made films in Finland and then mm -hmm. showed them here or else, you know, elsewhere. Um, and I just wondered how much that kind of, how much you think about that context when you're kind of planning one of your uh, performances, your videos, or, or exhibiting one of them. Like when preparing, uh, I'm, I call them interventions rather than performances mm -hmm. because of the audience expectation. But then, of course, context is everything. Like it is within a culture, mm -hmm. and also I'm thinking about what does like me getting in, into that situation look like. Like I'm a white woman, Finnish person, mm -hmm. like often a foreigner, but also I've done work in places mostly where I kind of can read the culture to some extent that I'm not completely like lost in what's the norm because of course the norm is different in different countries yeah. but I think everywhere there's norms like it's yeah. just it's a different one but um, there's a sense for me that I need to be able to understand what people want me to do to mm -hmm. meaningfully you know yeah. play with that and then also yeah but context is everything and I think with many things if you would do the same thing in a different country, it would look very different, mm -hmm. but it's just like part of the whole uh, setup. So there's the microculture of the mm. space or the situation and then country. Do you, do yeah. you think there's been a particular kind of um, intervention that you've done then that really could have only been done in say Finland, for example, or, or not so much? I don't know, somebody should go and try somewhere else and then we see, but I somehow didn't feel like I should take on this Compar like this right. comparing uh, countries mm -hmm. or cultures, whatever yeah. that means. Uh, it didn't feel productive or interesting mm -hmm. enough for me. But yeah, I mean, sometimes the I think in the stroker where I touch people in this London co-working space, mm -hmm. I think people being British like does make it funnier because <laughs> they have like hard time saying, they have hard time to say like, hey, I don't like this. It's yeah. like, oh, maybe, you know, I have a skin allergy or something. Like, <laughs> you have to have an excuse. Like, you need to say like, hey, this is not nice. <laughs> like, or maybe it's hard for everyone, but it's a scene to like play into the thing. But there were also people from different backgrounds and some people found it like normal or mm -hmm. found me friendly and didn't think there's something special mm -hmm. going on. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I guess for my, for my last question before I pass on to Michael, um, I was struck by an interview that you did with um, Art Monthly um, where you said that your interventions were a way of learning um, and that you choose to do them precisely because you don't know what the reactions are going to be. Um, and I just wondered if there have been any interventions um, that you kind of gave up um, because people responded in a way that you hadn't expected or because people just didn't react at all. I think with many things I chose something that is quite subtle, like the ones you mentioned where I walk around the mall with the cash uh, in a transparent plastic bag. It's not like every passerby is going to be freaked out, mm -hmm. but when I keep going back, I go back to the same shops. People like you can you can sense how people get annoyed. They get they have to deal with it. Like first they're just like yeah I didn't see that and I just continue with my day. So with a lot of things it's about also like sticking to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not looking for like an immediate like shock reaction. 
And also with the trainee, like somebody sitting doing nothing for an hour, fine. But then like when it goes on for days, it somehow like really the stakes like <laughs> grow. And even there it took time before people started to like ask questions. And, and there I, for example, like I started sitting at my own desk, but then I felt that people are just afraid to talk to me. Like it's not going anywhere. People are just freaked out and I sit there and everybody's just feeling bad, but <laughs> like there's no conversation. So then I, I like moved around the office. I went to different departments and then I wrote the lift which I initially thought maybe it's too funny, but then I thought, okay, like I should also write the lift to like have everybody encounter me in a different space. So there's also this modification yeah. sometimes when you get, go along with yeah. it, but often things are quite subtle and that's like, it grows kind of uh, slowly. Yeah. And lifts just by themselves are awkward. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're doing <laughs> yeah. an intervention yeah, or not. They're yeah. very awkward places. Um, cool, thank you. I'll pass you over to Michael, who's gonna talk about close watch more, more um, directly. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think the stroker is hilarious. I mean, it really, it's, it's a real testament to how British people can't talk about their feelings. So um, everybody should watch it, really. It's great. But um, back to Close Watch. Um, so as you've taken on many different personas in your practice in the past, I'm curious how you developed this particular role for Close Watch. Um, my other sort of part B to the question is, in recent years, uh, security and surveillance has intensified, in particular in public spaces. So how did this impact your work? So yeah, I start with the latter one. It makes more sense. So I mean, I've always like empathized with the security guard. Yeah, I had like them respond to me in like carrying that cash in the bag or doing other things that are like non-normative, but you know, just <laughs> annoying. So I kind of did, uh, did think about what, what it means to do that job, what it means to be the person who has to go and figure out like, yeah, what's happening here. Um, and then also this observation of like, there is so much more private security in public space and especially Finland where I'm from, Shopping malls are really, we have such a bad weather, like they are public space <laughs> and there's everything in there also. So they put everything in there, library, substance abuse clinic, like you name it, like everything is in there. You have to, you can't like avoid malls. Um, and then they are this in-between spaces, privately owned, the, whoever owns the property is hiring the security. Of course, there's laws that govern like that space too, but yeah, that's an interesting kind of like semi-public space. And I guess it just felt like now <laughs> is the time to look into the other side. Mm -hmm. And in terms of roles, um, it felt like the issues like, you know, that the job is so complex and these issues around like policing in society, security, uh, so large that it was really kind of like, instead of like developing, like thinking about the role already, I was really like, I just wanna try to do that job well. That was actually my like, not a role, but kind of like <laughs> attempt. Whereas like, if you think about the trainee, I first went and my role was to be like, as normal as possible marketing trainee, and then switch to this like, not so normal marketing trainee who is doing this brain work, whatever. But in this case, I knew like, you know, doing something funny in this workplace is not gonna make sense or be safe or be ethical or <laughs> anything like that. So it was more about how to be ethical when doing this job, when actually working here and participating in this like policing of the mall. Can I like sleep well at night? And if I can't, then why? And like, where do I fail? So it was really not a role at all actually, and also in terms of like, uh, often in my work, I kind of, I have a plan, I have a role and I'm able to control my own behavior. Like I venture to this uh, discomfort that is something that I can handle. But here the job was just so like complicated and the days were long. And it was more like afterwards, I'm like, why did I do that? And this was weird, you know? So it was more about like failing than having like this role or a performance and finding out through this like failing what the job is and yeah, what's going on. I think the installation for anyone that is um, at the Migros Museum, it's quite confrontational. 
um, in the sense that we see ourselves in the glass as we enter, um, and then we're allowed to go into the control room. And I was just thinking, like, do you think there are particular aspects or hidden aspects of the security world or the world of work that the piece in particular divulges to audiences. I think if, if I'm answering that question, I would say that for me, it's the fact or now I'm aware that guards are able to watch people through cameras for a whole day if they wish to. And, you know, this is quite disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I really wanted to, like the one thing that I felt like I had privileged access to when also taking on the responsibility of that job was the access to the control room and access to the kind of workplace culture, the place of like analysis, bonding, everything uh, between guards that is never seen by the public. Because when you go to the mall and you like, you know, do your job, people look at you. Also, you're being watched, you're being filmed <laughs> by, by people, you know, and, and of course, you know, it's also some, they also do a lot of work that we don't see in that way, but, but the really kind of um, place that is only accessed by colleagues is the control room. And also in my work, I really wanted to look at, you know, like what it is to do that job and what happens, like what are the decisions, what is going on in this, uh, this workplace. So with the installation, I kind of wanted to put the viewer also in the position of looking at everybody. And also it was, uh, it was pleasurable and also like felt really guilty to be able to look at everyone in the mall. Like, you know, I mean, we are aware, like we know there's surveillance, but it's just because you never, yeah, you don't watch the monitors. So yeah, it's just like- Because yeah. you, you don't normally have access to the monitors. So you're not aware of what, what you're able to see. So yeah. this is why now when I'm in this control room environment, I think about, you know, how am I being watched? And of course, it's important to say that museums have plenty of cameras in them. So whenever you visit a museum, you're bound to be filmed anyway. So um, yeah. My other question before I keep talking is um, I want to sort of take us back a little bit and think about the security industry and the research and the development of the security industry. Um, my research um, as part of the exhibition has sort of led me down many rabbit holes and one being that in the Swiss context there's, there are, there's a great deal of expertise in the country that offers very good advice on international security. How did you go about doing your research and how did this impact you while you were on the job or even after you developed the workshop with the participants? Like my kind of angle was this like, yeah, the, the position of the guard. And obviously the guard functions within like a larger system of like capitalism, of the laws in that country, of the like conventions, of the culture. And there's, yeah, there's the law, but there's then like how things are done. Like what is the <laughs> customary way to do this? So, um, I mean, only when like kind of getting into it, I found out like, oh, the, the education is just four weeks long. Like, mm, like, okay, let's like get this education. Of course, I didn't feel ready to do this, this work after those weeks. Like it was very short, but then I was like, everybody else is entering in the same way. I mean, not absolutely everybody. Like you can also do like a three-year vocational school for being a guard. So there's some people, who had a longer <laughs> school career, but there's a lack of workforce in this industry. It's growing really fast. So it's also very easy to get the job. So, I mean, I did approach Securitas and I did, I, I said like, I'm an artist and I will, you know, make some art based on this experience. But for now, like, I want to work here. And they were like, welcome, yes, we need people. Like, you know, we put you through the course and then, you know, you work for us enough hours, we're happy. So. It was really just like seeing what, what, like, <laughs> what comes to you. And especially then at the workplace, you learn it from your colleagues. So, you know, you learn the law in the course and then you come there and you see like, how is it applied or what is actually happening? Um, yeah, but it's also, yeah, growing fast in Finland. That industry, I don't know how much international expertise Finland is offering to other countries, but, but I guess because the Finnish people are very like, traditionally trusting the police, at least the white people. So then the kind of selling this idea that 
having more guards in uniforms is, makes places more safe has been easy in Finland. Like that has been a good, <laughs> a good product. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, just to add to that, as part of the exhibition, we have commissioned an extensive public program, which takes place later in the summer. And um, this is actually looking at a lot of these questions, which are related to the research behind the show. And we've, we, we will also invite some um, experts to take on different positions and debate this, actually, because um, I think there's, there's a, this is really important. And we've also commissioned um, a new website which will host the public program and other elements of the work and the project as well as it grows and develops in the, in the next few years. So just, just to plug some Migro Museum content. Um, but my next question is um, kind of, uh, yeah, it really moves on from what you just said in terms of um, while you were in this role as a guard, you you had to uh, perform the role, but you also had to build the trust of your colleagues, and you and you had to work with them, you know, for a, quite a long period of time. And then, when it was revealed that you were making the work, and and then in the workshops, um, how did you position yourself, sort of ethically, as a as an observer, perhaps in that context, or did you take on a different position? Yeah, so when I started the, the work, I decided not to tell my colleagues that I have like an agenda of research here, because basically I was just keeping a diary and there was no like, I didn't make recordings, I didn't know what I'm gonna make. And also I wanted to really be like, learning the job like anybody else. I didn't want any like weird, you know, like, oh, she's not really here, so whatever uh, situation. While I was quite like sure that it will take a short time for people to go to the internet and figure out. Uh, and it took much longer than I thought. Um, and I guess like while working, it was still a lot about the question about like how to, yeah, when you're learning this work, you follow the lead of the senior colleagues. You want them to trust you. You want to trust that they're doing the right thing while it's not always like that. <laughs> so that was one of the main kind of like uh, frictions and tensions working with people that you kind of have observed, oh, they're quite aggressive. They like to, you know, this is the way they speak backstage. They make like really bad racist jokes, you know, like uh, after that going like out with them, not great vibe. So, like, how to then, like, what to do there, you know? Because I, re you know, I'm new, like, th there's not so much I can, like, <laughs> I mean, I can question why are we doing this like this? Oh, I, this seems to me a bit whatever. Like, I did do that, and I did try to kind of ask questions and stick to it and ask again and be like, hey, to me, this seems unnecessary. But um, when, you know, you also have to just be doing the job and, and, I also didn't want to become someone who was like complaining about everything the first day. So there has to be had to be some humility in like I don't know how to do this work, which is true. Like, yeah. you know, I may have an MA from fine art, but you know, like it's not, it not doesn't qualify. I mean, maybe my practice does. Like the interest in behavior does qualify me more than some other people. But you know, in terms of like knowing what the work really is, it comes. So there has to be respect towards the senior colleagues, but then there's always this little friction. Mm -hmm. So I think the kind of like building the relationship really came out of like having done that work actually and having been there and kind of honestly just trying my best to do that job. And when somebody Googled me, then the gossip went around, uh, and then finally I heard about it. So there was a moment also when everybody knew, but they didn't tell me. Um, I also like, you know, talked to everyone. I was like, hey, if you have any questions, like, yes, I'm an artist, and I will probably make some art out of this, but I don't know what it is yet. Yeah. Most people felt like it was like, yeah, sure. Like, you, sh you know, if you told us, we would have treated you very differently. So it's good, <laughs> like, we understand, we understand. And it's also a job where you withhold information constantly from the public and you, you know, like everybody understands that there's this like classified <laughs> information and, and so on. So it's quite well understood, but if some people found it also kind of threatening. And you know, those people they were the ones that I didn't get along with so well. So it's also a very, you know, social thing or, you know, people who have very different like way of thinking and seeing the world. And then like first they already think like this person, let's see about 
you know, how, how are they going to do? And then turns out I'm an artist who's doing some like funny undercover stuff. So that was, um, but I, I convinced this person that I'm like, you know, still going to do the job like properly. I'm not going to like burn them all down, which is of course like, you know, what I should do. So there's like, I guess I build trust with some people well and not with others, but um, I kind of, after finishing my six months, I had a slow like climb out of the security guard role to the artist role to thinking like, so now what, you know, I, I was there, I have like a lot of pages of a diary and a lot of like questions and, and a lot of interesting things happened, but like where to go from here. And what I did, I, I felt like, yes, I asked my colleagues a lot of questions, but there were more questions that came up as I sat in the studio with all these notes. So then I asked a lot of different colleagues to come to an in, do an interview with me, like a um, long, like a three hour thing, but like anonymously. And there was already like, you could see that some people decided not to do it. So then the people who found it like, oh, she has something to say, let's, let's see. So then, you know, those people who did trust me to some extent would show up. And then, yeah, going on to the workshops, again, people, I guess, the ones who felt like I have, you know, I'm talking about something real, then they wanted to show up. Would you say that's because maybe for the guards, it reveals something about their employment and their own visibility as security is often underpaid, undervalued, precarious? I mean, in a way, you're, you're revealing... Um, their their stories or the kind of hidden histories of of the industry, really. Yeah, I mean, for some people, um, you know, some people really want to be heard. So there's also that aspect of like, yes, I will talk to you. I mean, this person who f who found me somehow threatening also wanted to tell me things. Like, we had like a three hour conversation. He really wanted to tell me like look, this is how it goes. This is, you know, like, okay, you're doing research. Let me tell you, you know, like how the, how the world works. So there's also this wish to like be heard. But then I guess because my invitation, especially to the workshop was very like, you know, you have to be kind of brave to step into some like different, you know, that was already like, I made the space in the kind of art area. So, I'm like, I'm your former colleague, now I'm an artist, but I'm kind of your colleague still, and let's like do this workshop together. So, so, I, so that's like, yeah, only the people who like felt kind of confident and, and that interested enough and brave enough to, to just give it a go, they came. But then like for some, I guess they just feel, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of this feeling of like, nobody understands how this work is, but then you're like, I understand how it's, you know, like, I do understand actually. And, uh, and you know, like, it, these are situations from the, from the workplace, so. Great. Um, I think now is a good time to open up for some questions from the audience. There's a question on the second row. You need the microphone first. I will repeat the question for those of us online, so. I'm just curious to, uh, like, how did you facilitate the workshops and, like, what, what, what was the content? Did, did you set up a research question at the beginning or, yeah, how did you? Yeah. So the question from the audience is how were the workshops facilitated and were there specific research questions that were answered? Yeah, so, asked. yeah, they were asked and some were answered, maybe not all. <laughs> um, there was a question that I had which kind of grew, I mean, I had it from my experience of working. And then when talking to my colleagues in the interviews, I felt like they also have it, which is, uh, what do you do when your colleague is doing something you don't agree with, like ethically? Like they either do something like really wrong, like use excessive force, like actually illegal, like, or they do otherwise something that you don't like ethically agree with, because the rule is you back up your colleague, like you always stand, you know, like somebody starts something and everybody else follows the lead like you have to be this united front. 
And this creates a lot of problems if the first person is doing something wrong. <laughs> so, but then that code is so strong, and for these reasons, like nobody understands how the work is, like you know, where nobody appreciates us. We're doing this hard job, and you know, there's all this uh, kind of thing. So at least, and also because your colleagues like sometimes save your life. You know, you have like a bond that is very different from uh, you know some other job where it's not like dangerous. So, but still like. So when I talked to my colleagues, uh, somebody said like, hey, of course, I would like to be the person who stops like an aggressive colleagues from like inflicting violence to some like, you know, that person, like random person. But I would actually just let it happen and then maybe afterwards talk to them. Like, I would like to be somebody else, but this where, you know, the system is so that, you know, I can't do anything about it. I would maybe afterwards then be like, hey, this wasn't cool. But if you are the person who is the victim of this violence, it's kind of too late. And also, you probably don't even know, and you probably never received justice or so on. So it was kind of like this kind of wish to be somebody else. Like, because I'm a guard, I can't like live up to my own ethical standard. So that was the kind of research question. And I chose to work with Forum Theater, like Auguste Ball, um, Theater of the Oppressed, uh, one of the techniques where you have like a conflict situation where there's an aggressor and a victim and a kind of like a bystander person. And then what is being like explored is like what this bystander person could do differently and could they affect somehow the outcome. So I chose a uh, situation from that actually happened in the workplace and some had to do with like the physical use of force and stopping this and giving feedback. And some had to do with the kind of racist jokes, other like kind of toxic uh, like way of speaking in the, like really just about like how the culture is formed. And because I try to be like, hey, this joke is not cool. And the people are like, ha ha ha, like it's, it's just funny. And you know, like I tried something, but it didn't work. So I'm like, if I would continue working as a guard, this is what I would need. Like I need some agency. I can't just sit here and listen to this. And also, if I sit there long enough, it normalizes, which is super scary. Like, all of this really normalizes quickly. You're just like, yeah, it is what it is, you know? So that was kind of the question and the need and the invitation to my colleagues to join in in this, like, exploring these ways. Uh, also coming from the understanding that they have this need too. Maybe I had it to like more like strong degree, and especially with also with the joking and stuff. Uh, but yeah, I had somebody who was like experienced in form theater and actors who were experienced in that who then like facilitated the workshop. Can I quickly follow up? Yeah. Um, one thing that's quite for anyone that's seen the video that, that is quite shocking almost is how kind of candid they are, and I wondered how much of that came through the fact that it was like what a three day workshop and like were they straight away like that because they all kind of knew each other and they knew you and they felt comfortable or did it take a did it take a while for that they were so self-reflective as well to, to an extent they yeah. were very self-reflective um so I just wondered like how much coaxing that took or whether they were just ready to talk as soon as I they think it's, it's combination of everything like that they I'm not somebody who comes from outside who's like hey I have this workshop let's explore this it's just like they really know what I'm talking about. We all had this three hour interview already. Like they know what I'm interested in, what's my thing. And they kind of trust me that I'm serious. Mm -hmm. Then of course, within the workshop, you kind of warm up, there's facilitation. And then the, the people who actually know how to do this forum theater, they also know a bit like how to get people kind of uh, warmed up and, and make it so that it's like a safe space to speak. Even though, of, of course, I filmed it, which was something that I knew is going to have an effect. And that's why I said, like, hey, I'm going to film it, but I will, if I want to use this material, I will ask you afterwards and you, ha you can veto anything. Like that it wouldn't be a space of like, we're making a film and everybody has to like say their most best comment or whatever. So, um, and guards are really used to being filmed. Like you're, everything you do is on tape at least in the mall. I mean, there's places where it's not like that, but where I worked and where my colleagues worked, like everything you ever do, your colleagues are gonna watch the tape like 500 times and be like, ha ha ha. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, being filmed is something, yeah, it's 
Yeah, I mean, I, I shouldn't ask a question, but I will quickly. Um, <laughs> the, the guards, I just, what I noticed in the film is that they're so well presented, they're so well groomed, like the, the uniforms are very smart looking, there's like <laughs> attention to detail there. Is this, is this, I mean, is this for the same reason, because they know that they're being filmed, or is it company policy? I mean, it is company policy, and not everybody follows it th thoroughly. But I think maybe for this workshop, people like didn't take the oldest shirt they have. But that was the uniform we wore for work. It's exactly the same one that we're wearing. And yeah, I guess mine, my shirt is like I only used it for six months, and I had another shirt to change. So like, <laughs> it like still looks really like crisp. <laughs> uh, any other question from the audience? There's one there. I just wanted to know, when they found out you were an artist, did they ask you to show your previous work? They had already been to my website and watched everything, so that wasn't oh, okay. necessary. <laughs> There's another question here. Um, you speak a lot about surveillance, and it's interesting that obviously you chose this um, opportunity to surveil covertly. Um, I was wondering if your colleagues didn't find out, did you have a plan to tell them? Um, what was that plan? And also, has this experience inspired you for future projects? If you can speak mm -hmm. a little bit about that or not. <laughs> um, yeah, I had, I had planned to come out to my colleagues before leaving the workplace. Like usually, like in these works, like the trainee or the stroker, I don't want to come out because I want people to like have the conversation about what happened as real. Or so. but in this case, I was, I wasn't doing like a funny performance. I wasn't like you know, I was maybe breaking some rules, but not like you know, like <laughs> not as art or whatever. So I really felt like after six months working, I want to come out and I was I hadn't decided on the method because I was like is it an announcement that is like official or do I like tell one person at a time so then it's like personal or what's the kind of route so I was just like already like thinking how to do it when then you know it was not necessary anymore and obviously yeah for future I won't say so much because there's actually not something clear going on yet but there's always like each work always has like something in there and then you're like yeah this wasn't explored so much but yeah usually the projects kind of lead one to another so something will be coming after this thank you and you mentioned from the very beginning about you are very uh, mm, serious about questioning the norm Mm -hmm. And all your project and performance is all about questioning the norm. Wherever mm -hmm. you go, you do the research. But just now you mentioned when you were um, working for the security guard mm -hmm. with the whole team, you feel because you're an artist, you can't keep questioning the norm. And you feel also afraid towards the end, you might succumb to the whole norm. And I'm just wondering why would that be a question for you? Just because you're an artist, mm -hmm. but artists actually draw from every day's life. And mm -hmm. whether you commit that as a project, which you say at the beginning, mm -hmm. you didn't even know what you're going to do. That's why you didn't tell everyone. Mm -hmm. So why would you not completely dive into it as just a human being that as what you believe to? Mm -hmm. And in a sense, you draw everything that you need for future projects. But at the same time, you kind of impact whoever you come into contact mm -hmm. yeah. to raise questions and to make the, yeah. that small society a better world. People start yeah. questioning. That's my question. It's so, a great I'll question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I definitely just went into that as a person. And then I have to debate with myself as a person. You know, like, because many of the things you do, like, you have to kind of follow the protocol. It's unsafe, like, not to follow the protocol. Like, I understand also, like, that... You know, if there's a first aid situation, like I have people who know actually what to do, I'm just gonna follow them. Like it is, it is also that other people know how to do this, and there is like, you know, it can be quite serious consequences if I decide to go against the protocol. But then in terms of like norms of like how people talk in the workplace, that I definitely questioned, and then I try to see like 
and then, but people shut it down. They're like, yeah, yeah, like you will, you will get used to it, you know, <laughs> you know, like. Ah. So then, like, I'm like, but I'm not happy with this response. Like, let me question again in a different way. So there was that, like, when to, and you can't, like, you also have to do the work. Like, you can't just. Uh, I mean, I could like refuse to do things and not go, like, when a colleague makes like a stupid joke and then we go out to do something. I could say like, I'm not going with you after this joke. But I think. I wouldn't, then I wouldn't be able to stay in this work. Like, then they would be like, hey, this doesn't work, bye. <laughs> you know, like, you can't do this job. So there's that, like, I do want to learn the job, but then what are the things I, you know, I can kind of go against and what not, and it's about, like, finding that. But, yeah, it's a great question because it's complicated. It's not like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a question uh, at the very back. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the understanding of labor in your work, because when you are working as, uh, you know, when you are performing as these uh, people who are working at different workplaces, so you are performing a form of labor. Mm -hmm. And when you are also working as an artist, you are again performing a labor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is a contrast complex layer of performing layer or uh, labor or, um, or being attached with labor. So how do you kind of, you know, resonate with this idea of uh, being uh, attached with this duality? Yeah. I guess it's a, you know, it's a strength or, a, you know, like kind of um, like working, doing the labor of security guard and then trying to also do the labor of the artist at the same time. Sometimes it's not possible. Like sometimes I just don't have the bandwidth, but then that I can like, have the privilege of stepping out of that and then doing the other labor. I think that's yeah, that's just something that is really amazing to be able to move between these things. And it's also yeah, going somewhere and kind of yeah, performing. In, in some other works, it has been even more performative in terms of labor. But it's always been like showing up and being there. It's not like you know, or yeah, showing up and just sitting. But like anyway, <laughs> like being there. But I think. Also, especially with the security guard work, I found that if I work that full time, I don't have the bandwidth for my labor as an artist. But on the other hand, I value the experience of like doing that work, being tired, not having time to think, and then only like one week later being like, hey, what happened one week ago? Like that was weird, like having time for reflection. So it's also knowledge like, okay, this work is quite tiring, it's quite intense. It you know might be better if there was time to reflect more, but um, there is not. So if I want to reflect and if I want to make art, then I need to like stop and <laughs> go to my studio. So yeah, it's yeah. I hope I answered your question, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Another question here. Microphone's coming. Thank you. Um, you spoke about ethics. And I wonder if there were any scenes or moments or language that you felt not com comfortable with sharing with us, the audience. Ah, like something that happened that I wouldn't want to let, let you know that happened in my workplace. Exactly. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. There was a lot of situation that I was uncomfortable with. So if you want to learn about that, then you can read my diary from the from the publication and of course not everything is there but you know like that the, you know the, there was every day something i think that was uncomfortable to different degrees and and for different reasons so it was like kind of one kind of like <laughs> like a navigation of discomfort but there's nothing that happened that i like would be like i'm not going to share this or this is not i mean things that you edit out when you're editing a publication there's different reasons to leave something out but it's not because like I don't want to share this or sometimes it's like I can't explain the situation is so complex or you know there's a similar example of this here but you know I don't use this one but yeah no <laughs> I can share it all <laughs> oh, one question there um, with close watch um, what we see in the video images is something that happened after um, you quit or after the whole experience. Um, I was wondering how was it in your other works? I mean, 
the result is always a video piece. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get these images? Is it candid camera or uh, do you restage some situations? Yeah. How does that work? So in a lot of my very early work, there is some sort of like direct documentation or candid camera, often combined with um, some reconstructed material. Um, for me, it's always like the research or the intervention is like that is the most important. So if there can't be a camera, there's not going to be a camera. If there can be some kind of hidden camera, then maybe. But with that also, using that material, then you come with this like ethical weight of like having filmed without consent. Even if you get approval or uh, consent afterwards, it's kind of, it's there. So then I worked away from that. Um, and I've done like reenactment. I've done like different ways of like storytelling that is kind of like something between reenactment and l something that looks like a fiction. And I've tried all kinds of like ways of like telling the, the story or telling the thing that is important, but doesn't need, that wouldn't need the like kind of candid camera element. And here in Close Watch is like, it's a kind of documentary. So you're watching the workshop, but then that's also a space of reflection and there's restaging the scenes from the um, actual workplace. So yeah, there's been different ways of doing that, but the the candid camera was kind of the early uh, method and also very uh, inexpensive method. <laughs> but then, like later, it, it does have a lot of issues also in terms of like, you know, it's not, you can't decide what you're going to catch and you know, it's very unreliable. So yeah, I, I worked away from, from that. <laughs> the question at the front row. Thank you so much for the interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, so I mean, Security Task gave you access, you gave them also your uh, time, um, but how did they react to your documentation, to the results of the workshop? In, in, in a sense, I mean, they probably, for, for, for the guards, it could have been quite an empowering experience to show their side of the story. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was just wondering if the company took any steps. Yeah, that's a great question. So from the start, kind of, I had this project I, I made for the Finnish pavilion in Venice. So I already had like kind of um, a position in Finnish society as like an artist and doing something important. And in my negotiation with Sekoritas, it was quite important that it's clear like what's happening here. So I you know got the job and we had employ employment contract with the knowledge that some art will come. But then after, okay, we did this, great, you know, <laughs> they, got, they got my labor, you know, like I got my experience. But after this, it was also quite like sensitive to like, how do I go about then the continuation or making the actual art so that it is like kind of fair to my colleagues. And then, uh, you know, like that Sekordas doesn't have too much like, you know, oversight or, that they don't mess with like what I'm trying to do. And they actually, I think because like I had, you know, presented this important position, like I represent our country in <laughs> Venice, you know, like you don't like, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> and also I had my own budget, so I didn't want money from them. So, so they don't, you know, and I don't know if they would have invested in like make, into making art, but um, there was this like understanding that I'm doing something and they just have to, let me do it and I think they decided to be fine with it because uh, they thought it's critical but you know there's so much bad press we all know like how much how many like misuse of power there is how much like problems there is in security like it's going to be more complex than you know the news that come out all the time and I did, you know, I said I want to do interviews, like would you just, you know, ask my colleagues if they're okay with me calling them, so they kind of facilitated, or I said like can these people get the day off, but then I would like pay them for their time, also for the workshop and the interviews. I paid the participants because they can't work that day and then they can't make the income, so, but then it's like, then they come to like my territory and it's not, uh, yeah, it's not for Securitas in any way. And I didn't, um, you know, I said like what the themes are and so on. But when I decided after the workshop, I had, I looked at the material and I was like, actually, 
I could make something from this. At that point, I didn't know if it's interesting, if the filming, like filming it, if it makes sense, is it, you know, is this what I'm doing or what, should I do something else? But when I had like figured out like, hey, actually I could work with this material, I first asked all the colleagues who appear in the film whether they would be okay with me actually using this stuff. And, you know, I had like a rough cut, like it looks like this. And when they all said yes, then I told like Securitas uh, kind of leadership, like, hey, now, now I know what I want to do <laughs> for the art and, you know, let's meet. And then we watched this together and they were actually pretty like, what <laughs> is this? <laughs> pretty shocked. And there was also people who had never heard about, you know, this project and they were just like, this is not in line with our like brand, whatever guidelines, or, you know, like something like super, like they're like, oh, I don't think this is okay. Also, because we're wearing the uniforms from the company. Like, I decided just to do that because that were our uniforms and I didn't want to brace for, like, they don't want to be, you know, affiliated with this or something. So I kind of thought, like, I'll just take the risk. I mean, they could have told me, like, you can't show this because it says Securitas here, and, but I kind of thought they, they understand it's a bad idea to tell me not to show something. So there was a kind of play in this, like, you know, that they understood that this is you know, they have to respect art because it's important, especially in this occasion. And then in terms of like the kind of knowledge of the workplace and the problems and so on, they, you know, I told them like you would, you know, I suggest, you know, like you get some like anti-racism training for everybody. Like it seems to be a bit like people don't like have the basic knowledge and so on. And they, they did actually implement that, that kind of thing. They, you know, there was some things about like these codes, radio codes uh, that are used kind of this shorthand in the radio that were quite problematic because there was like some ethnicities listed and some others not and so on. So I also said like, hey, I thought of like publishing this list because it's, you know, like, and they were like, ah, oh, no, actually it's classified document, you can't. I'm like, fine, but like, <laughs> you should change this. And they have actually now changed them. So there was all this like, little like conversation about that. And I mean, they did generally also want to know, like, you know, they also wanted the knowledge from my project, but then, uh, yeah, I also, of course for me, it's also still now, this, you know, probably will just make Securitas look like one of the nicer companies doing this business and they make more money and then there's more security because it's actually quite okay. And you know, they have now the training and everything. So there's always this like, as an artist, when you work with businesses like this that are quite powerful, um, there's always that like, it's never like, you can't be like clean in a sense, like, hey, I'm doing my art and it's critical and it's you know, not benefiting you. But, but I think, um, yeah, there was, there was the respect towards the art that I could count on, which was really good. And uh, yeah, in another context, I think if it was a, I was a, you know earlier career person showing somewhere like obscure little place, they would have just been like, you know, shut this down. <laughs> but now it was a bit like, it will not look good <laughs> to, <laughs> to do that. So yeah, if you know, I guess also for me, if I find myself in this position, then I have to see like what can I do. Like, I should somehow use it, you know, like the leverage. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Um, please feel free to join us um, outside for the drinks. Um, you need a little red dot, so find somebody with them. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so thank much you. for those. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> right. Oh no! It, uh -huh.